Last week we talked um, about Jesus. We're, we're, um, we're following the book of Mark, for those of you that are new with us, and we're finding ourselves in chapter 11. And last week we talked a little bit about Jesus in chapter 11 on his tri- in his triumphal entry. Uh, he's starting to make his way into the city of Jerusalem. He's starting to declare now by riding on a donkey. We read all that last last week, uh, riding on a donkey, his declaration as the Messiah coming in peace. We know that in revolu- re- 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 revolution, Revelation, uh, that when he comes back again, he'll be riding a white horse, and that then is a symbol of war. But right now, he's coming in peace. Um, he's coming as, as a sacrifice. We see that all in last week. Last week, we also took a look at all four of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, because this story is not just in Mark, but is represented in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So if you're looking for a general overview on this story, uh, check the podcast, and, and you can hit that up uh, or later on in the week, because that's going to give you a better idea of what we talked about last week. Uh, and, and over the next few weeks, we're going to be taking different sections of that story of the triumphal entry as Jesus steps into his final uh, destiny as our Savior, and um, we're going to be taking it apart and looking at different scenarios and different um, uh, different sections of it, specifically as they relate to the book of Mark, and uh, as we're following it in chapter 11. So today we find ourselves chapter 11 of Mark, verses 12 to 24. There's scripture heavy as well, so I'm going to be flipping back from different passages. They're all going to be on the screen. If you have your Bibles, you can follow along. And uh, let's go. Now the next day, when they had come out from Bethany, Jesus was hungry. And seeing from afar a fig tree having leaves, he went to see if perhaps he could find something on it. But when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. In response, Jesus said to it, let no one eat fruit from you ever again. And his disciples, they heard it. So they came to Jerusalem. Um, So when they came to Jerusalem, So they came to Jerusalem. Then Jesus went into the temple and began to drive out those who bought and sold in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. And he would not allow anyone to carry wares through the temple. Then he taught them, saying, it is, is it not written, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it into a den of thieves." And the scribes and the chief priests heard it and sought how they might destroy him, for they feared him, because all the people were astonished at his teaching. And then when evening had come, he went out of the city. Now the next morning, as they passed by again, they saw that same fig tree dried up from the roots. And Peter, remembering, said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree which you cursed Yet only yesterday has withered away. So Jesus answered and said to him, Have faith in God. For assuredly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, Be removed and be cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but but believes that those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. Therefore I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them." Uh, an incredibly deep passage this morning. There's a lot of different layers going on here, and I'm going to do my best to get through all of that content so that you can get a good idea of what Jesus is actually teaching his disciples here and what he's actually teaching you and me today. First thing you need to say, see right here is we have a prime example. Mark is classic for doing this, a story within a story. He's done this before. He does it a number of times. And this same story as it appears in the Gospels at different timing, it's kind of different, uh, differently placed around them. But Mark was very specific in how he laid out this story. Fig tree, cursed. The temple, money changers. Jesus goes in there and overturns the tables and says, you've made this into something it was not meant to be. Boom, goes back to the fig tree and sees that that fig tree is dead. It's done. It's all withered up. You see these three layers, kind of like a peanut butter sandwich. The, um, the interesting thing about this story is that the fig tree in this story is just a part of the sandwich. It's not really the focus. What I mean by this is, how many of y'all like peanut butter sandwiches? Well, not anymore. It's wild butter because, you know, all those, uh, those of us that are in school, those of us that have kids, no peanut butter allowed, wild butter. Uh, Wild butter, anyone? My kids love. Okay. Salami sandwiches. Um, Nutella sandwiches. It doesn't matter the bread. The point of the sandwich is the inside. 
We all know that. The bread is just bread, but the inside is kind of the point. So in this, so, this story within a story, this, this sandwich story, the point really becomes the center of the sandwich. And the surrounding story ties into the center of the sandwich, creating this whole multi-layer story. Are you following me? Does that make sense? Sort of? Kind of? You'll see in just a few moments. So I'm going to give you a brief overview, and then I'm going to start picking it apart line by line, word by word, and we're going to be here for six hours long. It's going to be, oh, that guy likes it. It's going to be awesome. Okay, so in this story, um, different perspective from Mark compared to the other Gospels, uh, because he specifically puts the story of the temple cleansing right between the judgment of the fig tree. Now, based on this sequence, and based on what I just said as being the point in a sandwich, we can concur that the writer here is trying to point us to the connection between the fig tree, the cursing of the fig tree, the withering of the fig tree to what? The temple or the people of God. If you read that, you can see that very clearly. If you don't believe me, uh, often in Scripture, the um, people of God... Uh, Israel, um, they are compared to a fig tree. If you look in the Old Testament, there is example after example after example. Time permits me today to give you every single example, but pretty much Isaiah, Jeremiah, Hosea, Micah, th- these guys all have it within their writings. Uh, they relate a fig tree to the people of God or to Israel. Hosea 9 verses 10, I'll give you this one. I found Israel like grapes in the wilderness. I saw your father's as the first fruits on the fig tree in its first season. And so we can see very clearly that there's something happening here within this construct of the fig tree story to the temple, specifically the people of God, and how this all relates to Jesus coming and why he is coming. An interesting part as we move forward in this is verse 14. And if we look at verse 14, chapter 11, in response, Jesus said to it, let no one eat fruit from you ever again. And the next phrase we see, and his disciples heard it. This is a very significant point in the journey of the story. I mean, if you miss this, it's kind of hard to catch up the rest of it. And his disciples heard it. His disciples, Jesus' disciples, didn't hear everything. They they, they heard things, but they didn't always listen to things, and they missed a whole lot of stuff because as Jesus was teaching, they're just like, huh, way over my head, huh, what, what do you say, Jesus? Jesus, let's talk a little bit. Try to explain that to me. For whatever reason, in this story, his disciples heard it. I would venture to say that if I could add to the Holy Scriptures, which I never would, that would be, you don't do that, but if I could put the word in there again, it would make even more sense. And I'll tell you why that that word again would make sense there because in Luke, don't worry, I'm not, I'm not adding to scripture just so we're all clear here, just so we're all on the same page here. No. Uh, Luke 13. So before all this happened in the book of Luke, there is a parable that Jesus tells his disciples about a fig tree. Luke 13, six to nine says, he also spoke this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard. And he came seeking fruit on it, and he found none. Then he said to the keeper of his vineyard, Look, for three years, Jesus was in ministry approximately three years. Anyways, I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none. Jesus was in ministry for three years to the people of Israel, trying to get them to bear fruit but he wasn't having much luck. Carry on. Cut it down. Why does it use up the ground? But he answered and said to him, Sir, let it alone this year also until I dig around and fertilize it. And if it bears fruit, if it bears fruit, well, but if not, after that, you can cut it down. This story, this parable was something that the disciples had already received. They'd already heard from Jesus. They had put two and two together. They knew the fig tree correlation from the Old Testament prophets to the temple, to the, to the people of Israel. 
They understood that, and they remembered this exact parable that Jesus had told them. And I venture guess to say that when Jesus walked by that fig tree that morning on the way into Jerusalem, and he looked for the figs, he did not find the figs, and he cursed that fig tree, the disciples' ears were perked. Why? Why were their ears perked up? Because they knew the parable. In essence, they almost knew what was coming. They knew that Israel, the time was coming, that for, for the temple, the time was coming. They had had chance after, they, they knew something was about to happen. And these next few moments, the next few moments for these disciples, they were keen to follow Jesus, except watch what he does and see how he operates. Now, when Jesus mentioned the fig tree again and pronounced judgment on it, we know that their ears perked up, and we know that there was something going on in their minds. That they, they wanted to pay close attention. Now, as these events unfolded, before we go right into that, there are some sweet nuggets here that we, as Christians, can pull out of this whole fig tree. So before we jump right into the whole temple thing, we're going to focus a little bit on the fig tree and the story that Jesus just read in chapter 11, verse 12 to 14. So we see that Jesus saw this fig tree. It had leaves on it. Leaves are what? Leaves are an indicator of health. If you see a fig tree and you say, or, or any tree for that matter, and you know that it's a fruit-bearing tree, you look at that and it has healthy leaves, that is a good indication that there's a chance here that we can get some fruit. We can be fed. A fig tree has but one purpose, to produce figs. It ain't producing apples, oranges, grapes, or watermelons, or even eggplants. It is producing figs. It's got one job. You had one job. That's it. And so we see that this fig tree, which is supposed to be bearing fruit and is indicated by the leaves, drew someone there to get the fruit to help sustain life. There was no fruit. It was false advertising. How many Christians do you know today that have, are, are full of leaves? I mean, Christians say, a lot of Christians today, we can do the right thing. We know, we know how to make our leaves look good. We, we know how to fluff the leaves out, just to put, put them right out there because, you know what, I don't want them to see that there's no fruit here. We, we can play the game pretty easily. It's not hard to do. Well, I'll show up to church on Sunday mornings. I'll do that you know, at least two to three times a month. Pretty leafy. Four times a month, oh man, you'd be like all these. Uh, I'll, I'll, put, I'll put tithe money in there. I'll do that every. I'll do that. I'll do that accordingly. I'll boom. I'll do that. I'll do all these right things and worship as Pastor Steve's leading for us. I'll look at him and I'll nod. I'll be like, yeah, brother, keep going, keep going. And as he's leading, I'll put my hands up in the air and I'll do all these things because I want the world to know that that I'm a Christian. But when you go back home, that's done. That's done. There's so many Christians. What does the Bible say? You will know they are Christians by their what? Love to one another. You can't fake love. L love is probably one of the most incredible fruits that we as Christians can bear. And if that love isn't there, then all this, that's just leafs. Leafy Christians are useless Christians. I'm sorry. Because none of y'all here, don't worry, it's not, it doesn't apply to you guys, it's all the online crowd. This isn't you guys. They, but, 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 but seriously, uh, the idea and the goal for a Christian really is found in 2 Timothy 4, verses 1 to 5. And, and I'll share the, or, or sorry, um, uh, Matthew 7, verses 15 to 20. Matthew 7, 15 to 20. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree, a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Say that five times fast. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits, you will know them. 
You will know the true Christians, the true followers of Jesus by their fruit. But there's something in this verse that just frustrates me. Because it was not, it says in... Ah, in verse 13, he says, he found nothing but leaves. If we just stop there, okay, okay that's good. But then the next statement makes sense. It's like, for it was not the season for figs. Well, Jesus, like, come on, man. Like, you're, you're asking a whole lot out of this fig tree. Like, a whole lot. It wasn't the season yet. You're coming up to it, and you're saying, listen, give me my food. You're, you're, you're cursed. It, that, that statement frustrates me. Because we all know that fig trees, or any fruit tree for that matter, has a season where they bear fruit and a season where they are dormant and don't bear fruit. And if you're a Canadian, you know that there's a season where they look dead, but they aren't really. Here's the verse. Watch this. What does 2 Timothy say in 4 verses 1 to 5 about seasons and the Christian walk? I charge you, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. And this word here, preach the word, isn't necessarily just a saying the word. It's a whole body. It's to represent the word. It's to live out the word. It's to speak the word. It's convey the truth. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. For the time will come when they will endure, when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. But you be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, evangelist fulfill your ministry. Verse 2 preach the word, be ready. In season and out of season. If you get nothing from today's short, quick message, we're still going, don't worry. Um, I want you to know that God's not interested in how you look and how fluffy your leaves are. He's interested in the type of fruit that you are bearing. To live for Christ, to go into the world, to make disciples of all nations, to preach the good news of Jesus Christ to everyone, everywhere, to live for him. We have but one job, one purpose, and by which there are all the fruit of the Spirit that we can live out and we will exemplify who we are. If you're not bearing good fruit, if you've got no fruit at all, how do you call yourself a Christian? If you're just leaves, how do we truly call ourselves a follower of Jesus Christ, living up to the full potential that he has in store for us? Next thing we read on to the temple is the cleansing uh, of the temple when Jesus rolls in, and in his righteous anger, he starts flipping the tables and kicking people out. Years ago, I was, um, uh, I was a youth pastor, uh, not as good as Pastor Chris, but I was getting up there. Um, and uh, in, in this city that I was at, I ran a day camp, and I hired a director. And this director, great guy, loved Jesus, had a heart of gold, and, and, and all that good stuff. I have to say that. And um, so I'm going to say something challenging right now. But, uh, so I, he, he was a very artsy guy. He, he's creative, artsy. Man, this guy, he, he was just, that, that was his world. And I remember going out for a meeting and coming back and seeing the whole summer camp on ladders, and on chairs on the exterior of the church with sidewalk chalk. And they were scribbling on the wall of the exterior, on the wall. Do you know brick? Brick is like really porous and really like, like, like gaps. In the, like they, they were just chunks. And it was, they weren't drawing nice pictures. They were drawing like, like they, it was just like scribble, scribble, scribble. Let's try and paint this wall in chalk that's hidden under the awnings and will never get rained on. I flipped my lid. I went over there. I kicked out that ladder. I kicked out. No, I didn't do that. But, but, but I, went, I went over there. And it was like unbelievable to me that these guys were doing this. And in some way, shape, or form, I know it was a defamation of property. And I know that God does not reside anymore in a building of brick and mortar. I get that. But still, something within me was like, dude, bro, you can't do that. That's just, that, no, 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 no. How do you, what's going through your mind? Like, what's going through your mind? And I wonder, 
I wonder if this story that Jesus, when he walks in there, what would make him freak out the way he did? What would put all this righteous anger in his heart? In order to answer that question quickly, we're going to have to look at the structure of the temple in which he is at right now. So if we look at the structure of the temple, we can see that it has a whole lot of different places. So in the, right in the middle there, that, that place is referred to as the Holy of Holies. Only the high priest could go into the Holy of Holies. The sanctuary, that was this area surrounding the uh, Holy of Holies, was only for the priests. They were allowed in there. And then you had the court of Israel. It was just outside there in the white. And that area was for the laymen of Israel. They were allowed to go there. And then in the court of women, obviously the Jewish women were allowed to be in there. And then they had this whole area around the perimeter, uh, on the inside of the walls, the perimeter, the yellow area, which was called the court of the Gentiles. Now this is very significant to this whole story because it's specifically the court of the Gentiles that Jesus is referring to as his frustration, as some of the angst, and why he is acting the way he's acting. The court of the Gentiles was a place where Gentiles of any kind could come and experience the Hebrew God. It was a massive area on the outskirts and surrounding the temple. Uh, The Gentiles were only allowed to go there. If they went anywhere else on the temple grounds or in the temple itself, they could be found guilty and the penalty would be death. Uh, This was where the flea market, as I like to call it, was taking place in this yellow area. Seems like you got a ton of space there. It almost seems to make sense that the chief priests and the scribes would say, hey, let's put a flea market in there. People are, people are needing to buy their, you know, their doves and their animals for sacrifice. Why not just put it in that area? It's such a big open space. Let's just use it for that. This is key because up until this point, we know that Jesus came specifically for the Jews through the Jewish people. That's who he was born through. But we know that at some point, things changed. And he said, listen, I'm not just here for the Jews. You guys got to understand, I'm here for all people, the Gentiles too. And the Jews had such a hard time with it. They had pride. They wanted to be the, the, the chosen people of God as they were, but they wanted to keep that as it was, and they did not want to share that with the world or with anyone. They wanted to hold on to that just for themselves. So this area where the Gentiles were allowed to experience the presence of Almighty God was where they uh, put up their flea market, merchants ripping people off, wheeling and dealing, selling their wares for overinflated prices. One commentator says this, the result of all of this was that those who came into the court of the Gentiles of the house of God, instead of being filled with awe and a realization of the presence of God, they found themselves in a busy marketplace with buyers and sellers arguing and disputing loudly and furiously, prospective sacrificial animals and birds adding their own particular protests, money changers calling out their rates, but they were only Gentiles. We're the Jews. We are the chosen people. The view on the Gentiles was such that they were only Gentiles. And so it did not matter. Jesus' actions in the temple represented the cursing of the heart of this nation because it had nothing but leaves. It appeared to have life, but in reality it did not. It appeared to offer hope to men and women of the nations of the earth. From all over the earth, people were coming to the temple at Jerusalem, hoping to find an answer to the emptiness and the burden of their heart. But instead of finding the one true God, they found the flea market. They found people ripping them off. They found people yelling at them, bickering, complaining, whining, up in the prices here, up in the prices there, cutthroat, cutthroat, money, 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 ripping off. This was supposed to be a place where they could experience the presence of God, but anything in this place that they were experiencing was but. And that was on Israel. That was on the chief priests. That was on the scribes. They made that decision to turn that place into something it was not designed for, something inherently against the gospel. It was as if their decision to do that created a mountain of an obstacle for every Gentile to come to Christ. 
Because now they had to get through that. They had to get through all this and say, what, what? what? I, I just came, I need, I, need, I need to experience God. But you've got this mountain of an obstacle in front of you. And this is why I believe at the end of the chapter where it says, you will say to this mountain and it will be moved. Well, well so many Christians, like guys, so many of us, we say these things out of context. We've, I've got these mountains in my life and I just say, speak to my mountain, move and it will be gone. And I'm like, Really? Well, that's what, it, that's what it says. That's what it says right here in the way. Let me, let me find it. You know, it says there, you know, uh, uh, Surely I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. We, we take that and we internalize that as to things that we want. When does God really, in this whole scenario, when has it just become about me and what I want? And by, It's never been about that. When you read this passage in the context, you can easily see that the mountain here is allegorical. It's not a literal mountain. It could be a literal mountain, but it's not. It's an, the idea of a mountain of an obstacle. You see, this was so incredible because in, this story, in, in, the, um, in the story of the temple, why Jesus went in and, and ripped apart the temple was because they turned the area that was supposed to bring the gospel message to the outsiders into a flea market. And God hates that. Anytime, anytime we take something that has the potential of bringing forth the gospel and we block it, that's a mountain. That's a mountain. And we create mountains in our lives so many times, whether we realize it or not, in our relationships with our neighbors, in our relationships with our peers, in our relationships with our family, our coworkers, our work, even in our church, we create these obstacles that block people from experiencing the presence of God. Well, I'm tired of it. I'm tired of these mountains. And I'm tired of there being things in our lives, whether it be corporate or personal, that are blocking people from receiving and experiencing the gospel message, the truth of who Jesus Christ is. So let's stop it. So let's pray to God to get rid of those mountains because souls are at stake here. People experiencing the truth and the power of God are at stake here. And that's the point. That's the point. Jesus walks by. And he sees with his disciples, and they see the roots, or they see the, the, the fig tree. And the fig tree was, um, the word says, the fig tree was withered from the roots. This is key. And lastly, we close with this. Thanks for bearing with me. I'm rushing like a, like a maniac. As we see this fig tree, if it just died and kind of flopped over, well, that, that says one thing. There's a good chance that those roots could bring it back to life. But the specific language that is used here saying that the um, fig tree died from the roots up signifies that it's over. It had its chance, but now it is finished. The key to us, to you and me, and this was, this was in direct relationship, direct correlation to the temple in A.D. 70, that temple we read yesterday, uh, last week, we learned last year that in A.D. Uh, 70, that that temple crumbled. It, the, the city was taken over. Everything, the people lost their lives. It was this horrible, horrible battle. And not one stone was laid upon one stone. It was completely flattened. And even in uh, A.D. 363, there, there, there was an emperor that tried to build it up again. He couldn't do it. Couldn't happen. The roots were gone. That temple won't be rebuilt again until the second coming of Christ. And that's what it says in the Bible. So don't even bother trying. It's not going to happen. Um, but the key for us today is to be rooted in the word of God. Now hear this. Hear me when I say this because I'm saying this in love. And this is why it's so important as Christians to be rooted in the word of God. Not rooted in what I say. Not rooted in what Joyce Meyer says. Or Bill Johnson, Stephen Furtick, Joel Osteen, James McDonald. Stop. Do not be rooted in what they say. Be rooted in the word of God, my friends. Be rooted in his word. Use those people as supplements. But be rooted 
in the word of God. I'm not saying they're bad people. They're great people, phenomenal people, anointed people. I, but, 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 but if you're turning to them before the word, you've got a problem. If, you, if you're looking for the, the next podcast, oh, I can't w- wait, wait to see what James McDonald says about this. Oh, I'm dying. That. Oh, my goodness. Turn the TV off. Crack your Bible open. See what the Holy Spirit says to you through the word. And then when questions arise, then when challenges arise, then you can go to other teachers to see what they say about it. But for Pete's sake, start here. Be rooted in the word. And I believe that as we're rooted in the word, as the Holy Spirit takes conviction in our heart and in our minds, that our heart will connect with his heart so that the desires in our heart, when we ask him for things, they will be so connected because, because when we're looking for things, we, my heart is that all will know the gospel, that all would be saved and none should be lost. That's what Jesus' heart is. And when our heart connects with his heart and we step out in faith and live it out, and that's when those little figgies start growing. That's when those orange blossoms turn into oranges. And that's when good fruit starts to be born, starts to take place. My friends, bear good fruit. You've got one job. One job. Bear good fruit. Father in heaven, we commit this time to you. And God, I simply ask right now that that you will bring that conviction in our hearts, in our souls, and in our minds, that we will bear good fruit. That, oh Lord, we will bear good fruit for your glory. That, God, at the end of the day, we will not just be seen as leafy Christians. Leaves are a symbol. They can be an indication of health, but the only true indication of health is good fruit. And the only way that we can know that it is good fruit is by tasting and seeing that you are good. Challenge us this morning to bear good fruit. And as we connect to you, as our hearts connect with you, and as our hearts desire to beat for the same things that your heart beats for, that our asks and our requests will be right in line with your gospel. That there will be nothing in our lives that will hinder, that there will be nothing in our lives that will act as an obstacle or a mountain to the gospel of Jesus Christ, just like the flea market was in the day. God, I pray that you bring conviction to our heart, speak to our souls, and let us truly live for you. We love you, Jesus. We thank you for your word this morning, and we thank you for your challenge of truth. There is no greater name but the name of Jesus, and it is in that name that we pray and we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.